This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Our Military History Night Halloween special was held October the 30th, featuring the ever-popular Derwin Mack on the subject of witchcraft and the British monarchy. Royally and bewitchingly, here's Derwin. <laughs> Right. Well, tonight we are here to talk about witchcraft and the British monarchy. And this is one of the very few known obscure facts of our monarchy, is that there has been the scourge of sorcery has been haunting the British monarchy for centuries. Every dynasty since Plantagenet times has had some sort of involvement in witchcraft. Either witches, or alleged witches, were out to end the royal family, or, in some cases, members of the royal family were practicing the dark arts. Right. Now, the uh, biblical commandment to persecute witches comes from Exodus chapter 22, verse 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, and that is the uh, you know, biblical commandment. Oh, so there's the justification to go persecute witches. However, medieval Europeans did not hunt witches, despite the biblical commandment to do so. That's because the official church ideology was that only pagans, not Christians, believed in witchcraft and superstitions. And since you know it was the pagans who believed that people could cast spells and tell the future, and since Christians were different, therefore uh, you know we didn't believe in witches, and there was no point hunting witches. Indeed, Charlemagne even passed a law uh, prohibiting the hunting of witches. However, what uh, popes and kings tell their people isn't always what the people believe, and old habits die hard. Uh, the common people and peasants still believed that there were people with supernatural powers, and there was a whole profession of people who sold magic charms and amulets, cast spells, and made magic potions for the common people. Now, these people were not perceived as being threats to society. They were just there, helping out when they could. So, despite the church and the ruling class saying there are no witches, ordinary people still believed that witches existed. Now, as uh, Europe reached the end of the first millennium, a series of catastrophes and problems befell Christendom. Uh, starting about 800, the Vikings began to raid the rest of Europe. Not necessarily like this, but uh, the they're, they're, they're Vikings were raiding Europe and causing trouble. And then, as the year 1000 approached, many Christians thought that doomsday was coming, that you know, there would be the end of the world with the second coming of Jesus. And that became you know, known as millennial, millennial doomsdayism. It actually reoccurred only 13 years ago amongst some people as well, for the second millennium, the end of the second millennium. Now, shortly after the first millennium ended, Europe got into its first large-scale war against a non-European power, the Muslims, with the start of the First Crusade in 1096. And then, a couple of centuries later, there was an even more catastrophic war with the Mongol invasions of Europe. You know, the Mongols were rather nasty and caused all sorts of destruction. And the worst was yet to come. After the Mongols, the Black Death, a plague, hit Europe. You know, 75 to 200 million people, or 30 to 60 percent of the European, European population, died of plague. Now, during these centuries of trouble and invasion and plague and catastrophe, uh, people became very fearful and they looked for scapegoats. And here are the, the usual scapegoats of the period, you know, Jews, uh, gypsies, and heretics, especially the Cathars. But when people become more fearful and paranoid, they start to look for even more scapegoats than the ones they can find around them. And around 1200 to about 1500, European Christians began to develop the idea that there must be some great source of evil out there, some you know, almost demigod of evil, like, like a bad counterpart of God and Jesus. 
And they began to think that Satan was the source of all evil. Now, previously in Christian theology, Satan was a minor figure. He was the guy in the book of Job who puts Job through a lot of trials and tribulations with God's permission. That's interesting to notice that in the book of Job, Satan and God actually seem to be colleagues. Uh, but around 1200, the idea arose that Satan was the source of all evil. And not only that, Europeans began to think of, identify Satan with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. So now, God had an evil counterpart. And people began to believe in witches again, because if there's a God of evil out there, then certainly he must have followers and acolytes and minions, and those must be the witches. So those people who uh, began to, uh, who were selling magic potions and casting spells and you know telling fortunes for the peasants, they began their reputations began to get worse and worse. And Christians began to think of witchcraft as being a form of Satan worship. In 1326, Pope John XXII declared witchcraft to be a form of heresy. So now, all those people who were practicing you know, magical arts and casting spells and making potions were now associated with an obvious crime, heresy. Which brings us to the Plantagenets, specifically the House of Lancaster. England's first big royal witchcraft scandal came about in 1419. Now, at that time, the king was King Henry IV of England, and he was married to Joan of Navarre. Uh, it was an uneasy second marriage for both of them. And as the English have from time to time, this was a dysfunctional royal family. Uh, king Henry tended to argue about politics frequently with his son, the Prince of Wales, later King Henry V, and Joan, rather than siding with her husband, always sided with her stepson. Well, this was too much for the king, so uh, he had her, he accused her of attempting to poison him by using witchcraft. And she was tried and convicted and imprisoned in a castle in Sussex for four years. However, uh, she was later pardoned and released. The next witchcraft scandal involving the royal family occurred in 1441, when uh, King Henry VI thought that there were witches plotting against him. Now, this is not a picture of King Henry VI. This is his uncle, Humphrey of Lancaster, Duke of Gloucester, and his wife, Eleanor Cobham. Now, Humphrey of Lancaster, Duke of Gloucester, he was the son of one king, Henry IV, brother of a second king, Henry V, uncle of a third king, Henry VI, but he was never to become king himself. However, he was in the line of succession after Henry VI. Actually, he was the next guy in line. And his wife, Eleanor, would not have minded him becoming king and her becoming queen. Now, Eleanor, it turned out, uh, consulted with Roger Bolingbroke, an astrologer, to have her fortune told. Now, Bolingbroke was no ordinary magician selling magic charms to peasants. Oh, no. He was a celebrity astrologer. His clients were the aristocracy. Right? So he catered to the upper classes. And he told Eleanor that King Henry VI would die and that Humphrey and Eleanor would become king and queen. Well, of course, Eleanor was quite happy to hear about this fortune. It turned out Eleanor had other supernatural friends. Uh, she also knew a witch named Marjorie Jordanay, the so-called Witch of Eye who sold spells and potions to the lesser classes. Well, this fortune by Bolingbroke, though it no doubt amused Eleanor, did not amuse the king. So Eleanor Cobham, Roger Bolingbroke, and Marjorie Jordan were arrested and charged with treason. Now, they weren't actually charged with witchcraft. They were accused of using witchcraft to carry out their treason. Well, at the trial of Roger Bolingbroke, various objects were put on public display. These were proofs of his occult dealings. They included wax figures of people, a magical scepter, a sword, and copper talismans. 
The trial did not go well for Bolingbroke, and he was convicted and hanged, drawn, and quartered. Marjorie Jordanine did not fare well either. She was also found guilty and burned. Eleanor did admit to using witchcraft, but for purposes of getting pregnant, not for killing the king. Nonetheless, she was found guilty, but rather than executed, she was marched through the streets of London in disgrace and then imprisoned for life. Now these names, like Eleanor Cobb and Richard Bolingbroke and Marjorie Jordanine, may seem familiar because Eleanor Cobb and the witches show up as characters in Henry VI, Part II, by William Shakespeare. Now, these trials were of high-profile political characters. Uh, although, at the beginning of the 16th century, despite witchcraft being linked to Satan and heresy two centuries previously, uh, there were still very few witch hunts. There were no large-scale witch hunts in, in Europe. Most witch trials were of political figures in politically motivated cases. And there was a legal void in England and Scotland. There were no actual laws against witchcraft. The accused were usually charged with treason or some other crime, and witchcraft was, was, was thought to be their modus operandi, the way they committed the crime. But that would change in the early 16th century. In 1517, uh, Martin Luther nailed his theses to the to the door of a church in Germany, and thus began the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Now, this set off over 100 years of wars of religion in Europe between Protestants and Catholics, and eventually also between competing factions of Protestants. This is one of the sad scenes from that period, St. Bartholomew's Day in France, 1572, when the Catholics went up and massacred the French uh, Protestants. And during this time, uh, people's neighbors, people who could be your neighbor, would suddenly become your enemy the next day. And there was religious fanaticism and paranoia all throughout Europe as both sides ranked up for war against each other. And in this period where people are paranoid and fearful of their neighbors and where religious factions are becoming more and more uh, you know, fanatical, uh, people start looking for other people to punish and thus, Finally, witches became targets of both Protestants and Catholics, and major witch hunts began throughout Europe. And this is a picture of the burning of witches in Baden in 1585. Right? Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. In a two-century span, 20,000 people were executed as witches in Germany alone. Right? Now, what's also amazing to us modern uh, to our modern society is that witchcraft was, uh, these witch hunts occurred in the early modern era. We tend to think as, of the medieval era as being the backwards, you know, superstitious era, but there were no witch hunts in the medieval era. Witch hunting began in the early, early modern era of Europe, because not only was this the era of the Reformation and the beginning of new religious thought, but this was also the start of the Renaissance. And it was also the period of the age of discovery and trade and commerce and the settlement of the New World. And trade with the New World sparked the start of modern capitalism, modern banking, modern commerce. And as the economy of Europe began to shift to trade and commerce and shipping, uh, was, uh, agriculture became less and less the engine of the economy and it hastened the end of feudalism. So it's really amazing that it was really modern Europe that started the witch hunts, not medieval Europe. Well, witch hysteria was spreading across Europe, and the reigning dynasty of England at the time, the Tudors, would, eventually, would become interested in witchcraft. Uh, in 1536, Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII, was accused of adultery, treason, and incest. Now, there were rumors at that time that she was a witch, but she was not ever accused of being a witch during her trial. These uh, rumors of her being a witch arose after her execution. And nonetheless, fear of witches is high enough that Henry VIII passed England's first Witchcraft Act in 1542. 
This is the first act that actually defines witchcraft as a felony and a crime punishable by death. It also removed the benefit of clergy from persons accused of witchcraft. Benefit of clergy is a medieval concept that if the accused could read a passage of the Bible, he should not be hanged. Anyway, if you were accused of witchcraft, even if you could read from the Bible and you were found guilty, you could still be hanged. Now, this act was not very popular, and it was not enforced very much because the English didn't really see much reason to use it, and it was repealed by Henry's son, Edward VI, in 1547. However, his daughter, Elizabeth I, passed her own witchcraft act in 1562. Now, this is actually a more lenient act than the one her father had set up. Death was the punishment only where harm had been done. So if you were found guilty of witchcraft and someone had been harmed due to your activities, you could get the death penalty. However, if you had practiced witchcraft and no one had been harmed, it was a harmless spell or you were simply just making talismans and amulets, then the worst penalty you got was one year imprisonment, rather lenient. The benefit of clergy was still denied, and Elizabeth moved the authority to try witches from the ecclesiastic courts to the courts of common law, which she thought would give accused witches better legal protection. Now, it was under the Elizabethan law that England had its first major witch trial, and this was in Chelmsford in 1566. Three women were accused of witchcraft. One of them, named Elizabeth Frances, had given a cat called Satan, of all things, to her friend Agnes Waterhouse. And Satan was alleged to be able to turn to a toad and cast evil spells on people. So Elizabeth Frances and Agnes Waterhouse were arrested and charged, and Joan Waterhouse, Agnes' daughter, was also arrested and charged. Well, it ended with Agnes Waterhouse being found guilty and becoming the first person hanged for witchcraft in England. Elizabeth Frances was imprisoned for one year, and Joan Waterhouse was acquitted. Now, this is a trial that popularized the concept of the familiar spirit. That's a spirit that can take on an animal form and follow the witch around, usually a cat. Well, Chelmsford turned out to be a hotbed of witch activity. Thirteen years later, there was another witch trial at Chelmsford. This time, Elizabeth Frances was arrested again, but she was not so lucky. She was found guilty and hanged. Meanwhile, up north, Scotland's reigning dynasty, the Stuarts, had become bothered by witches. Mary, the Queen of Scots, passed Scotland's first witchcraft act in 1563, which made both witchcraft and consulting with witches punishable by death. Alas, she should have been paying attention to people other than witches, because her worst enemies were not witches. They were actually Protestants. She was in a very precarious position as a Roman Catholic monarch reigning over a country that was becoming increasingly Protestant and increasingly fanatical about its Protestantism. And also in the 1560s, a civil war raged in Scotland between the Protestants and the Catholics. In 1567, Mary's Protestant enemies murdered her husband, Lord Darnley, and overthrew her. In her place, they installed her one-year-old son, James, as King James VI of Scotland. Now, a one-year-old boy can't possibly take on the duties of government, so the Scots installed Mary's brother, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, as Regent of Scotland. Well, as soon as James Stuart, the Earl of Moray, was installed as Regent of Scotland, people began to plot against him. And in 1568, several people were arrested as supposed conspirators in a plot to assassinate the Regent. One of them was Sir William Stuart of Luthery, the Lord Lion. Back then, as now, the Lord Lion was the chief minister of ceremonial in Scotland. It's still a very important ceremonial position in Scotland. It's the person in charge of all state ceremonial. It's also the person in charge of granting arms in Scotland, granting coats of arms, that is. 
Today, you can still petition the Lord Lyon to get a coat of arms granted. And actually, I read that the job is available now, so if you want to apply for it, please submit your resume to Elizabeth II. Well, Sir William Stewart of Luthery was one of several people arrested on conspiracy to kill the Earl of Moray. While in prison awaiting his trial, he wrote the worst letter ever written by accused in his own self-defense. He wrote to the regent, the brutes of your grace's murder was tossed up and down Edinburgh. What he was getting at was so many people in Edinburgh knew about this conspiracy that there was no point warning the regent. That was hardly the best grounds for not telling your boss that people were out to kill him. And then he admitted that he had consulted a fortune teller, and since this fortune teller had correctly predicted the deaths of various other political figures, and then this fortune teller predicted the death of Moray, well, there was no point warning the regent that he was going to die next. Well, this letter partially worked in Stewart's favor. Well, he was acquitted of treason but convicted of witchcraft, so he was burned to death in 1569. Now, despite these trials and despite the witch hysteria going out in Europe, in continental Europe, England and Scotland rarely prosecuted witches. These laws existed, but they were rarely enforced, and they were typically used for high-profile political cases like the Lord Lyon. However, this would change soon. And it would change due to the man on the left, King James VI of Scotland, later to become James I of England. By 1589, he had grown into an adult and was getting ready to, and wanted to get married, and he got engaged to Princess Anne of Denmark. So King James went to Copenhagen to meet the future in-laws and his bride, and he discovered that the Danish king, Christian IV, and the Danish court were obsessed with witchcraft. They thought there were witches all over Denmark, and of course these witches were conspiring against them. And Denmark was holding large-scale witch hunts throughout the country. Well, James was a rather, uh, you know, spiritual person. Uh, he prided himself with being a theologian. Today, we know him mostly as the king who commissioned a new translation of the Bible, which we know as the King James Bible. But when in Denmark, he became interested in witchcraft, and he considered the study of witches to be a branch of theology. So, he began to study witchcraft with his future father-in-law, the King of Denmark. Well, James went back to Scotland to prepare the wedding. Then Anne went, decided she you know, get, got ready to go to Scotland, and she and the Danish fleet started sailing for Scotland. Well, some nasty storms hit the Danish fleet, and her ship nearly uh, sank, but fortunately, it did not sink. It was blown off course to Norway. Then James, when he heard about this, assembled 400 of his knights and soldiers and sailed off to Norway to rescue her. And they held their wedding in Oslo instead of Scotland. Back in Denmark, people began to blame each other for the problems suffered by the Danish fleet. And someone blamed the admiral of the Danish fleet for not providing ships that were strong enough to withstand the weather. The admiral uh, then blamed a wife of a court official who he did not like. He said that that woman was a witch who had cast an evil spell on the fleet. Well, so she was arrested, and as happens at always trials, when the accused is questioned and tortured, she begins to name other people as witches. Soon, there were witch trials in Copenhagen of both nobility and commoners. Back in Scotland, when James heard that something was rotten in the state of Denmark, he began to wonder whether there were Scottish witches conspiring on him, and whether Scottish witches had also cast a spell on the Danish fleet. Well, just by unlucky coincidence, a woman in North Berwick was accused of witchcraft at this time. When, he heard, when the king heard about this, he, he immediately jumped to the conclusion that North Berwick was the center of a great witch conspiracy against him. So he went to North Berwick, and 100 people were arrested and tortured as witches in North Berwick. 
There, he personally interviewed one of the suspected witches, Agnes Sampson. Now, here's an intriguing picture. The man with the stick is beating these accused witches at the bottom, while King James of Scotland watches the beating while seated on a throne. James' interest in witchcraft grew as time went on. In 1591, he heard that a woman named Mary Napier was on trial for witchcraft. Now, Napier threw herself on the mercy of the court and said that she was pregnant and that therefore, since she was going to bear a child at any time now, she should not be executed. James wrote a letter to the jury and the judge saying that they should examine her to see if she was pregnant and if she was lying, execute her. Uh, the jury and the judge did not appreciate the they did appreciate they did not appreciate the king interfering with the trial, and uh, when they acquitted her, the king was most upset. Throughout the 1590s, witchcraft research thrived in Scotland. Theologians, clergy, and nobility all studied witchcraft and how to hunt down witches because that's what their king wanted. And in 1597. King James wrote his best-selling book, Demonology, a book about how to identify and hunt witches. Now, this is quite startling at the time. Uh, can you imagine what would happen today if Elizabeth II came up and said she believed in vampires and she was going to write a book about how to hunt vampires? Well, you know, back then, you know, it was quite normal in Scotland for the king to write books like this. Now. Shortly after his best-selling book on witches was published, the Scots, he, he presided over the great Scottish witch hunt. So the Scots held this nationwide hunt for witches in 1597, and 400 people were tried and 200 were executed. Now, a little later on, in 1603, there was the Union of Crowns. James VI of Scotland inherited the English crown and King King James I of England the two countries remained separate, but ruled by the same person. So now Scotland and England were both ruled by a witch hunter. And one of the first things he did in England was pass a new witchcraft act in 1604. Now this was influenced by European witchcraft laws. He expanded the offenses that qualify as witchcraft, and he had much tougher penalties than the Elizabethan act. Under Elizabeth I, if you had committed witchcraft, but no one had been harmed, the worst you got was one year in prison. Under King James, you got death for everything. And he was so interested in witches, he even asked uh, William Shakespeare to include witches in one of his plays. So Shakespeare included three witches in Macbeth, which was also political propaganda to justify the Stuart regime. However, he was rather disappointed to find that his English court was not as interested in witchcraft as the Scottish court. Although the English had a witchcraft act, English noblemen really weren't interested in hunting witches. A lot of them didn't even believe that witches existed. Uh, they attributed that to the barbarities and uncivilization of the people up north. So uh, James did not have very many people to go witch hunting with him in England. So he went back north and conducted yet another great witch hunt from 1628 to 1631. However, English attitudes towards witches would change later on, thanks to the man on the left, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, in 1641, English Civil War broke up between Parliament and King Charles I, the man on the right. Now, on the surface, or ostensibly, this was a war between king and parliament, but it was actually a war fought on different levels. Uh, there was the political level, but it was also a religious war as well, because the Puritans backed parliament, whereas the Church of England backed its leader, king, the King Charles I. It was also an ethnic war. Scots fought English, and everyone fought the Irish. Right? And, yeah, and, 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 and this was yet another one of those wars where your neighbors could turn into your enemies overnight. You didn't know who to trust, because that's the way civil wars are. Also, 
the Puritans were very fanatical in promoting their religion. And as religious fanatics tend to do, they want to stomp out all enemies of the religion. And this included Satan worshippers and witches. They believed that witches existed. They believed that Satan was their lord. And so the Puritans began England's first large-scale witch hunts during the Civil War and all throughout the Cromwell regime. The most notorious of the Puritan witch hunters was this gentleman, Matthew Hopkins, who used the title Witch Finder General. Well, well, if England had an attorney general and an auditor general and a solicitor general, why not a witch finder general? And so he traveled across England saying that he was witch finder general, working on behalf of the parliament. As it turned out, his credentials as witch finder general were fake. Parliament, yeah, parliament never appointed him as witch finder general. Uh, he holds the records for executing the most people for witchcraft in the British Isles. He executed 300 women in just three years in the parliament controlled areas of England. Uh, the trial that made him famous was a trial in 1645 at Chelmsford, which is the site of yet another witch trial. Uh, this made him famous throughout the country, and he was able to go across England, you know, providing his services as a witch finder. He would also act as prosecutor and witness for these trials as well. His modus operandi was he would get the local nobility to set up a special witch court, he would find the witches, arrest them, you know, provide the evidence, prosecute them, and everyone complied, and the witches were executed. He is the man who introduced several well-known witch tests to England. Uh, these are the tests you see in horror movies today. For example, he was the one who introduced the English to the idea that if you tied a witch up and threw her into water, uh, if she floated to the surface and lived, she was a witch and should be executed. Now, if the poor accused drowned to death, uh, that was unfortunate, but she was innocent and was with God in heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> he was also the person who introduced the idea of examining witches for evil marks and warts. He would strip naked the accused woman and examine her for weird-shaped marks and warts, which he said were signs of her devil worship. He never conducted these examinations in private. Hopkins would be there, his assistants would be there, the local judge, the local nobility, the local lawyers, local magistrates, the local clergy, and any male with any kind of social status would suddenly find a reason to show up for the examination of a naked woman. Plus, he introduced the test of witch pricking. Oh my God. Yes. He, uh, he had a theory that every witch had a spot in her body where if you poked it with a sharp object, she would not feel pain. So he and his, his assistant would keep on poking the accused with sharp objects. They invented their own, they didn't use sewing needles, they used longer, sharper objects, right? And if they didn't hit the painless spot right away, well, they just kept on trying until they found the spot. Uh, most of the accused uh, finally gave up and just confessed just to stop the pain. Now this actually created a whole new profession. There are people who actually joined the profession of witch pricking. <laughs> I wonder if they got a certain word from that. But anyway, so this went on. He also pioneered sleep deprivation as an interrogation method. He and his assistants would keep the poor accused awake for days on end by coming in and pricking them and stabbing them and torturing them until they finally confessed after days without sleep. Witch hunting and witch pricking turned to lucrative occupations for Hopkins and assistants. Uh, towns would pay him 20 pounds per investigation, plus traveling expenses for his services. The towns also had to pay his assistants, who were paid six shillings per day. At a time when an average worker's wage was six pence a day, the assistants made 20 times the, the amount of an, order of an average worker. In 1647, Hopkins wrote his bestseller, The Discovery of Witches, one of the definitive books on how to identify, hunt, and execute witches. 
However, his career was not to last forever. After having executed 300 women in three years, various parliamentarians began to notice that Hopkins had amassed a large fortune. And they began to question whether he was hunting witches for the glory of God or whether he was in it for the money. Also, local nobility and local authorities were noticing that the mere visit of Hopkins to the town could create civil unrest, because people didn't want to be accused of being witches. So eventually, local authorities and members of parliament forced him to retire. There is some controversy as to how he died. Some people say he died a natural death. Other people say that he was discovered to have a book about witchcraft in his possession, was himself accused of being a witch, and then killed by an angry mob. Meanwhile, north of the border, things got worse for accused witches in Scotland. A right-wing Presbyterian group called the Covenanters took over the parliament in 1649. And since the Covenanters were very devout in their religious faith, they decided they had to get tough on witches. And they passed a Witchcraft Act in 1649, which was tougher than all the previous Scottish acts. And they started yet another great Scottish witch hunt. Now, this is quite a major hunt. 300 people were executed, and they were so zealous in finding witches, they actually crossed the border to northern England and started pricking English women to determine whether they were witches. And the Scots, who always seemed to be running witchcraft trials, held another great witch hunt between 1661 and 1662, shortly after the collapse of the Cromwell regime. In this hunt, at least 600 people were tried. The amount executed is not known because record keeping was rather poor at that time. But witch hunting would come to an end in the British Isles. In 1660, Parliament voted to bring back the exiled King Charles II, and and thus we had the Restoration. Now, Charles II was you know, probably a lot less uh, strict than his father, Charles the executed late Charles I. He uh, liked nightlife, living it up, drinking, eating, partying. Uh, he spent a lot of his time with beautiful women, such as the actress Nell Gwynne. So during the Restoration, religious piety was no longer a priority of the government. And so witch hunting stopped for a while in the British Isles. Oops, Let's see. Plus, the Restoration also coincided with the Age of Enlightenment. Europe was going, undergoing another period of social, cultural, economic, and scientific change. Modern science was developing. And in this era, believing in witches and hunting witches became passe. There was just no scientific basis for it. In 1712, a woman named Jane Wenham found herself on trial for witchcraft in England. Now, this was a controversial trial. The judge, John Powell, himself did not believe that witchcraft was possible. When one of the witnesses said that he saw the accused flying through the air, the judge said, there is no law against flying. (laughs) Nonetheless, the jury convicted Jane Wenham of witchcraft, and the judge had the unenviable task of imposing a mandatory death sentence based on the law passed by King James. Well, Queen Anne thought this was all nonsense, so she stepped in and pardoned Jane Wenham. And Jane Wenham became the last person convicted of witchcraft in England. Thus, the House of Stuart finally redeemed itself. It was a Stuart king who had started major witch trials in the British Isles, and it would be a Stuart queen who would end them. Queen Anne was not only the the queen who ended witch trials in the British Isles, she was also the first queen of the United Kingdom. In 1707, England and Scotland merged to form the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom was born during the period of the Enlightenment. So in 1735, the British Parliament 
repealed the English and Scottish Witchcraft Acts and passed its own Witchcraft Act in 1735. Now, this act is called the Witchcraft Act, but that's a misnomer. It doesn't actually make witchcraft illegal. What it did do was it made it illegal to accuse a human being of having magical powers or practicing witchcraft. It's an interesting example of a law passed during the Age of Enlightenment to promote one of the scientific ideas of the Enlightenment. So you can see that England and Europe and Britain and Europe were changing over time. However, which, there would still be witchcraft scandals with the British monarchy. The Hanoverians, the dynasty that came after the Stuarts, would not be immune. And its witchcraft scandal centered around this gentleman, George, Prince of Wales and Prince Regent during the insane period of his father, King George III. Uh, unlike his father, George III liked living a various uh, licentious life, at least by the standards of that time. He liked uh, you know, partying, drinking, gambling, and he ran up large drinking and lifestyle debts. He also had a scandalous life of very many beautiful women. Uh, he even illegally married a woman named Maria Fitzherbert, who was a commoner, twice widowed, older by six years, and a Roman Catholic. Uh, never before had a Prince of Wales married such an unsuitable bride. Uh, and the marriage was illegal because he did not get the permission of the king to marry, marry her. So it was an illegal marriage. Now, the Prince of Wales had run up many debts due to his lifestyle. And um, he, uh, he asked, he, he was in danger of, of not paying his debts. Now, it would be really embarrassing for the Prince of Wales to declare bankruptcy and be thrown in debtor's prison. So, so he asked his father, King George III, for money to bail him out. The king said, no, I'm not going to give you money. But what he did do was he advised his son to marry a princess with enough money to pay off his debts. So he searched through Europe for a suitable princess. And there was only one princess who had enough money and was willing to marry him. And that's his first cousin, Princess Carolyn of Brunswick. They had never met before, but they got engaged. And when they met, uh, George was so horrified that he asked one of his men to bring him a brandy. Uh, his opinion of her was that she was short and ugly, lacked tact and decorum, reeked of body odor, did not wash, and did not change her underwear. Uh, Carolyn, likewise, had a similarly unappealing uh, opinion of her, of her cousin. Uh, the prince is very fat, and he's nothing like as handsome as his portrait. Uh, nonetheless, you know, these two people got engaged anyway, I guess out of desperation. And they did get married, and uh, they, they had sex, I guess, enough times to have one child, and then they never saw each other again. Okay, so they, it was a very raucous marriage, uh, and it was a very public broken marriage, played out in the new medium at the, at the time, the newspapers. Here's a political cartoon showing the king, the the Prince of Wales, and chatting up yet another young lady, right? And uh, here's another political cartoon showing a Caroline with a lineup of men who were willing to ignore the body odor and have affairs with her, right? Uh, th this marriage made Charles and Diana look like a harlequin romance. <laughs> they were so dysfunctional that at his coronation, King George IV locked Carolyn out of the Westminster Abbey. Okay. Well, there was a witchcraft scandal involved here, believe it or not. Uh, people, there were rumors that Carolyn had a lax voodoo figure of King George IV and would poke it with needles and beat it and throw it in the fire just to cause him grief. Of course, uh, nobody knows whether it's true, but it was good gossip for the newspapers of the day. Well, in the 20th century, British witches worked openly, free of prosecution. Like this character, Alistair Crowley, you know, he did whatever he wanted, uh, you know, didn't suffer from the uh, prosecution, was never put in trial. And in 1951, the British government repealed the 1735 Witchcraft Act and replaced it with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Now, 
This act made it illegal to deceive people by claiming to be a psychic, a medium, or a spiritualist for reward, except for entertainment purposes. Now, this act was unenforced for about 30 years until Margaret Thatcher came to power. And for some unknown reason, Margaret Thatcher's conservative regime decided it had to prosecute people under the Fraudulent Mediums Act. And there were five prosecutions out of conviction between 1980 and 1995. The Fraudulent Mediums Act was repealed in 2008 and replaced with anti-fraud legislation that was more in line with European community rules. Nonetheless, I do have evidence to follow that the current royal family, the Windsors, are practicing witchcraft. Well, here it comes. Okay, so as you can see, uh, Harry, Kate, and Will have been taking classes at Hogwarts. All right. That must be Potter's wand. It doesn't look like Snape's wand. But anyway. Uh, all right, and here's uh, the Princess Royal with J.K. Rowling. Now, this is a very interesting photograph. Why is the author of Eng Britain's most best-selling series of books about witches wrapped in the British flag? <laughs> The real occasion here is that uh, the princess is presenting J.K. Rowling a, uh, an award for donations to a university in Scotland. And look at this headline from the Daily Mail. Charles and NHS homo homeopathy row. Prince holds secret meeting with health secretary and lobby for treatment denounced by top doctors as witchcraft. Right? So could Charles be a witch? <laughs> well, so, we've seen that uh, there's been a history of the royal family, of the British monarchy, involved in witchcraft through successive dynasties. Will the British monarchy survive witchcraft in the future? Right? Well, Will and Kate have to deal with witches. Indeed, could members of their own family, maybe future generations of Windsors, indulge in the dark arts? Well, if you want my personal opinion, I think the monarchy will survive the scourge of witchcraft. And it survived under Macabum, it survived James I, it survived uh, numerous conspiracies, you know, it, it'll survive Fergie asking for bribes to introduce people to her ex-husband. So I am certain that our monarchy will survive witchcraft. God save the Queen. <laughs> Question. Yeah, question period. Yes, there's yep, questions over there. Um, I have only one question. And of the many witches that were burned and executed, how many of them were men? That's an interesting question. Um, the, the records are, are rather sketchy, of course, from that period. But it's estimated that uh, throughout Europe, about 20% uh, were men and 80% were women. Women tend to be the targets of, uh, of, of accusations of witchcraft. Right? Uh, in terms of numbers, um, I mentioned that Germany had 20,000 people executed. The British Isles did a little better. Uh, of the three Isles combined, you know, England, Scotland, Ireland, uh, between 2,000 to 3,000 people were executed uh, in a two-century span. Amazingly enough, one tenth of them came from just one person, or actually by just one person, Matthew Hopkins. Thank you, Gerald. Very pleasant, most congratulations. Tell me, why were the witches on brooms? <laughs> why were witches on brooms? You know what? I don't really know that question, the answer to that. Uh, other than it's typically what uh, women used as part of their trade, and women were always being accused of witches. But I think the answer is they need to fly somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who'd have thought that brooms could actually fly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, not so much a question, Derwin, but it's very interesting when you look back at the history of the Salem witch trials. The majority of the women that were accused refused to marry and give up their property and their property rights. Mm -hmm. 
and that was actually the real reason behind it, that they would conform to what was in British common law, even the United States. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is actually behind what was going on there. Well, well, well certainly a lot of which accusations were used to, uh, to, I guess, persecute women who were, who were traditionally underclass, and especially women who did not conform to societal norms. Uh, you mentioned that uh, they could be unmarried, or they could you know, actually have an occupation of their own, for example, uh, making amulets for other people. And, uh, so, and it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's always been, uh, I, guess the, 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 I guess, the stigma of witchcraft has always been applied against women who are just nonconformist. I guess Mary Poppins cleansed all that. <laughs> That's right. Plus the three girls were charmed. <laughs> Do you know where any of the um, the books that were written are archived? The copies of the the books that you oh, like demonology. It's mm -hmm. fine. Um, I'm not sure they're archived. I'm pretty sure the British Library has them. I would I just like to say that you can get them on the net. I have a copy of one of those books that's been reprinted. Oh yeah, and you can get them on the net. That's great. Yeah, witchcraft for the uh, ah, for the web era. So, yeah. That's a Masonic symbol as opposed to a witchcraft symbol. So, um, What's I, the kind of it? Um, well, it's, it's, I know it mostly as the back of a $1 bill from the United States. <laughs> so, but uh, I don't know. That, that's more a Masonic question than a witchcraft question. But maybe next year we shall see. Uh, but we saw it. We saw it in witchcraft. Oh, yeah, that was Aleister Crowley, right? And he was involved, he, he mixed masonry and witchcraft and Egyptian mythology all together. He, he was not exactly what you call a pure witch, although I'm not sure how one ascertains Puritanism and witchcraft. <laughs> anyway. Thanks. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for joining us by podcast. We look forward to having you with us for future events, whether via internet or, we hope, in person. Either way, thanks for being with us, and goodbye for now.